Uh, welcome to Parální Polis, uh, to a special event today. Uh, it will be in English. I hope that all of you understand English. Um, because our guest, uh, even though he speaks a bit of Czech, uh, is more comfortable in, uh, in speaking in English. So uh, today's lecture will be in English. Uh, today's guest is Patrick Kropa. Uh, he is uh, quite quite famous hacker. He was a member of the Legion of Doom. And uh, he has a very interesting uh, history behind him. And today he will talk about the evolution of disruptive technologies from a first-person perspective. So uh, I'm really looking forward to, to this talk. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all of you who supported us by uh, buying a seat reservation and uh, also uh, all the people on, on the stream uh, who support us with, with voluntary donations in cryptocurrencies. Uh, if you didn't support us yet and you like today's lecture, uh, we would be very grateful if, if you decide to send us some, some small donation uh, as a token of appreciation. So, uh, Patrick will give a talk and then we will have uh, some space for questions. And uh, just, if, if you have a question uh, in the discussion, raise your hand and I will give you a microphone so that uh, people on the stream will also be able to hear your questions. Enjoy the evening and I give uh, the space to Patrick. All right. Dě, děkuji moc, je to, je to hezký být ve Praze, ale moje čeština není dost dobrá, abych udělal celou prezentaci v česky, tak to musím změnit do angličtiny. Um, my, my, my history with, uh, with technology goes back to being about seven years old, eight years old, and getting an, uh, an Apple II Plus computer back in the, the Stone Ages. And... Uh, that, that, that was interesting. You could you can do magical things with it. You can you actually install a shift key mod, which was a hardware hack that let you use lowercase letters, and then you could upgrade the RAM to an incredible 64K from the standard 48K that it came with. Um, anyway, so there there was there was this computer, and over a period of time, you figured out what was possible to do with it. And especially at that point in time, it was possible to understand everything, the hardware, the software, the operating system. It was just the dawn of time. Everything was pretty primitive. And uh, one of the most interesting things that happened was uh, software. So you're a kid, and there's all this software, and at the time, all of it cost you know, insane amounts of money, just like computers did, because, you know, to get an Apple II Plus, and, you know, you get a disk drive for it, I mean, if you, if you really, really pushed it upwards, there were these things called Corvus hard disks, which gave you an incredible, you know, four point something megabytes of, of storage, which was much bigger than a floppy disk. But but anyway, so the question became, well, how do you get all the software because you're a kid and you don't have thousands of dollars to go and buy it? So the answer is, of course, you you made friendships at different gatherings and uh, you, you learned to crack software. And basically, that that was piracy. That was sort of the beginning. And I'm talking about the late, the late 70s, the very early 80s. And... Uh, Groups of us got together and we would trade things. And uh, what was most interesting about software at the time was not really the programs themselves. What was fascinating is how did the software publishers protect it? What was the protection scheme? How do you make it so that you can make a copy of it because they made it so you could not make copies of it. And then, you know, you learned, uh, you know, how do you boot trace a disk? What is actually happening? How do you follow the entire process from the moment that the program starts? And how do you intercept that? And how do you deprotect it? And uh, that was, you know, the inception of the first pirate groups for personal computers. And uh, right around that time, the way that we communicated was on bulletin boards. It was called BBS systems. And uh, 
BBSs are pretty much what online forums have evolved into today and social networks, things like that. And uh, so I, I started participating in them. And we would, you know, call these different systems where groups of us would gather. And it was a very, very small world comprised of maybe, you know, a few thousand kids spread across the world who had access to home computers at a, at a very early stage. And what, what happens is, like, after the first month, you get your phone bill, and your, your parents freak out because your phone bill is like $2,000. And the reason for that is because, well, again, the, the, the Internet wasn't there. You were making long-distance phone calls across different countries, different states, all over the place, and it was extraordinarily expensive. So just like... You know, why do you become interested in cracking software and on, on understanding all these things? It was, well, well, why does it cost so much money to make a phone call? How does this system work? And the answers were pretty interesting because it actually cost nothing to make phone calls or very little money, and it was largely profit by, by different phone companies. And I was, I was growing up in New York City, and so in my room, I had two phone lines, and one of them was the new ESS switch, which was the electronic switching system that have evolved into what we have today, which is you know software-controlled networks of very high complexity and uh, out-of-band signaling. But my other phone line was on a crossbar switch, which is a mechanical switch that uses in-band signaling. So what that means is, you could use a blue box, you could trunk a phone line, and suddenly if you had access to what was called a TSPS console, which had a few extra buttons or a few extra tones that you could simulate with uh, this modem that was called a, an AppleCap modem, which was very popular at the time, you, you basically had the power to become an operator in the phone company. You could route your calls anywhere on earth that you wanted to, and you could connect for free. And that was cool. That was, that was very handy, because suddenly the entire world became accessible, much like it is right now. I mean, you get on the Internet, the whole world is there. It was not like that in the 1980s. So that led to making friends with an entire different subculture of people who were the very early phone freaks who were experimenting with uh, exploring the largest network at the time, which was the phone company's networks. I mean, you know, AT&T was also responsible for Unix, they were, or rather Bell Labs, they were also responsible for a lot of very interesting systems. And you discovered that you could gain access to these systems and suddenly you could explore what the phone company is doing, which means you had the ability to uh, sort of play God with the phone lines, which is a lot of fun when you're like, 12 years old or 13 years old. Like, the phone companies at the time always claimed it was completely impossible for them to listen to other people's conversations. Um, well, that's not exactly true. That wasn't actually true at all. There's this feature called monitoring line quality. And theoretically, whenever an operator comes on or someone is listening to your phone call, there will be a tone. It will alert you to this fact, except, of course, you can turn off that tone and you can intercept people's phone calls pretty much with impunity. And as you kept moving onwards in your knowledge, the the largest barriers were, there. I mean, there's no documentation. There are no man pages. There's just you sort of exploring in the dark with a flashlight trying to figure out what works or what doesn't work. And uh, groups of us started exchanging this information with one another, which was the very early hacking scene. And eventually people who were good at what they were doing got together and they formed these different groups who would, uh, well, explore the phone company's computers together and explore other systems and basically just see what was out there and see what existed. And this was a long time ago. Uh, we, 
uh, let me let me not say we let me say myself <laughs> I engaged in uh, writing hacking programs that would basically allow you to get the codes for a lot of competing different phone companies and just make free phone calls. And then I gave that away to everybody who wanted to use it so they could all make free phone calls. And uh, we wrote one of the first viruses that existed for the Apple II computer. <laughs> and uh, you know, it, it, in retrospect, was that a nice thing to do? You know, no, it, it was not, but the term teenage boy and sociopath are often interchangeable because at that stage in your life, you don't really understand the consequences of what it is that you're doing or what the ramifications are for some person who downloaded it and, okay, their entire system just went away. And that was, that was actually a really cool thing in the Apple Two, you could uh, you type call negative one fifty one. You would drop to monitor, and uh, suddenly you entered coe nine, coef. I mean c zero. It's you know hexadecimal, and basically those two actions would drop the head on the drive onto the platter, and then it would make the platter spin at random. So you could destroy an entire disk in about less than a second instead of going through this entire process of deleting files or re whatever. People would notice that. With this, it didn't matter if they noticed that. There was no time to respond to it. So, And uh, then something else happened. There's this group of people who started writing antivirus software. This entire industry kind of spun up around our... Uh, you know, antisocial experiments, and they started to monetize it and make money off it. And, you know, we were obnoxious, and we released uh, a couple more revisions, and then we just got bored with it and found something else to do. But, you know, viruses obviously continued to evolve, and anti antivirus software became an entire gigantic industry, as did almost everything that was associated with computers in the early days. Um... All of, the, all of the good times sort of came to a halt during a series of raids. I mean, there was a collection of my phrase, friends who were indicted. There was a collection of people where they just showed up and they visited your house, which is your very first sort of intersection where this abstract concept becomes real because the Gestapo is kicking in your door, you're 16, 17 years old, and there are, you know, there's the police, there's the FBI, there's the Secret Service, there's a bunch of guys with guns, and all of them are going on witch hunts. And even if they did not indict you, they had a lot of questions, and it's, okay, I don't want to answer any questions, but they made it very obvious that, you know, number one, they know what you're doing. Number two, if you don't stop doing that, then you're going to get visited again and again and again. And eventually, when you're over the age of 18, you're going to have some significant problems. So I kind of took a break from computers for a little while. I, I went to school and I got bored, and a, a group of us in New York City started this system called MindVox, which was primarily myself and my partner, uh, Bruce Fancher, and a lot of our friends from the Hacker Underground at the time. So what we were actually going to do was make an online multiplayer game called Maelstrom, which we were working on. And the betas were progressing, and people were, were looking at you know, what was possible to do with it. And we started a messaging board just kind of as a sideline. And the messaging board sort of turned into a very embryonic social network because the, the Internet had started to happen right at that moment in time, which was late 1991, early 1992. And sort of by accident, we became the third internet access provider in the United States and the very first in New York City. I, I think the first was Bob Rieger, who had the World Software Tool and Die in Massachusetts. And then there was, I'm, I'm sorry, Bob Rieger had Netcom in Los Angeles. Uh, Barry Shine had the Software Tool and Die in, in Massachusetts. And we were... 
well, the first in New York City. And we didn't just provide people with shell access to a Unix machine, we sort of wrote this entire layer over it so that the average human being could log in, understand it, and know, hey, you, you've got email. And email was uh, pretty cool at that point in time because up until then, you literally had to route your mail by hand using bang paths. Bang paths were exclamation points. So you would, how do you get your mail from point A to point Z? You would route it from this machine to that machine to that machine to the final destination. And then UUCP, which was Unix to Unix copy, would copy your email to the, the final destination. And uh, we were right around the time that ad signs started being used for email addresses, and uh, we, we put the whole system online so that it wasn't just people from New York City, it was people from the whole world could suddenly connect. And that was, that was very pivotal at that point in time because it made the whole world accessible to you. It was the beginning of the internet as we know it today. And at, at the time, there was, uh, there was a couple of publications that were in existence. One of them was uh, High Frontiers, uh, Reality Hackers, which eventually became Mondo 2000. And that was coming out of Berkeley and uh, that, that whole area in, in California. And the other one was Wired, which had just started publishing its first issues. And we showed up in their very first monthly issue. And there were just, there was a huge influx of people from all over the world showing up. What was also there were all my friends from the computer underground. So our systems administrator was this guy named Len Rose, who is a very talented individual. His handle was Terminus. And uh, he was actually, at the time that we, that we first hired him, he was living in a halfway house because he'd been arrested for the terrible crime of possessing source code to login.c, which was the, pro the, the property of Bell Labs or AT&T. This is years before Linux existed. None of that was around back then. And uh, one of our primary uh, programmers and people who made the whole thing sort of come together was an individual named Fiber Optic, Mark Abene. And uh, at, at that time, he was, you know, facing indictment and he was about to go away to prison for a year. So our main fear was not, not so much would this be a successful company. I mean, that, that, that we weren't really thinking about that. That was kind of accidental. It was, okay, w when will the Secret Service or the FBI show up and kick in the door and just confiscate everything? <laughs> that was what we were expecting. And our way of protecting ourselves from this was just to gain as much exposure as possible. And ultimately, there was this person named Kim Clancy, who was at the time working for the Secret Service, and she hosted an entire forum on the system where a Secret Service agent was moderating the conversations between a bunch of hackers who had been arrested by the Secret Service and the FBI because they had not yet figured out who had jurisdiction over what, and uh, discourse actually happened. People were listening to one another. It was, uh, it was an interesting intersection point where suddenly dialogue occurred, whereas before that there was nothing, there was silence. There was just the evil bad people who would show up and arrest you for thought crimes because what did anyone really do? And inevitably the answer is what they did was they accessed systems, usually systems that were of interest to the government. And that really, number one, scared the shit out of them, which makes the government go on a witch hunt. And it really pissed them off. And they wanted to let you know that. And there were, there were three different mailing lists. There were like email lists. I mean, what mailman is today, it was similar to that back then. And that was the Leary L list, which focused a lot on uh, transhumanism and drugs. There was future culture, which was sort of just exploring the possibilities of where all of this technology could lead to and what could happen with it. And there was 
the cypherpunks list where uh, that, that was, you know, essentially that was John Gilmore, who was one of the first founders, of, one of the first employees of Sun Microsystems. He's a brilliant guy. Uh, Timothy and uh, St. Jude, who is Jude Milhan, who was at the time one of the editors for Mondo 2000, uh, coined the term cypherpunks. That was the beginning, that mailing list, those conversations, and what immediately made it very relevant I'm sorry, what? Uh, this was the early 90s. It was probably 1992 to 1994 where, where all of this began to overlap and sort of intersect. And what made it all light up was uh, this guy named Phil Zimmerman who wrote the software called PGP, which was pretty good privacy. And that was the first time ever that military grade encryption suddenly existed for anybody who wanted it. So, so that led to an entire series of events where the government, you know, decided that they wanted to, you know, prevent this from occurring. And uh, the, the end result of all that was like, okay, so we're not, they're, they're not going to distribute the source code. They're not going to distribute the object code. They're going to literally print it on paper. Here's some paper. Here's PGP. I mean, it, it was silly, some of the extreme lengths to which, you know, it was conceptualized it could go if PGP was banned. But of course, it was not banned. So that was the beginning of, uh, of cypherpunk. Then uh, for me personally, all of this intersected with, with drugs because during my earlier evolution when I was uh, getting together at these different meetings with people, the, there were these things called TAP meetings happening in New York City. TAP stood for the Technological Assistance Program, and it was one of the initiatives started by Abby Hoffman and the Yippies. And uh, TAP was really all about anarchy and sort of taking control of the phone system, taking control of technology and empowering and educating yourself. And I met a lot of interesting people at these meetings. And a lot of them were all on drugs. A lot of them were all from the 60s. And at the time, I had no idea what the counterculture even was, what any of these things were. I was a kid who was interested in computers. And uh, anyway, as time progressed, I became more and more addicted to heroin. And all throughout Mindvox and all these wonderful things happening, I was also shooting speedballs, which is heroin and cocaine. And I had become more and more addicted, and ultimately I, I hit a very low bottom, uh, which is I, I turned 30 in jail in this place called The Tombs, which is in New York City, which is not, not, not a fun jail to be in when you're going through withdrawal, and that was... That, that was sort of the low point. That was the ending of Mindvox. We ended up selling, you know, selling out, get, selling the assets to other companies. And uh, by then, I had tried every possible detox that existed because I had money. I had access to medical care. And, you know, what I discovered was that absolutely nothing worked. There was nothing that could get me off heroin or nothing that worked for me. And I knew about this thing called Ibogaine, which is a psychedelic drug that has the very neat side effect of completely rebooting your entire system. So if you have a polysubstance abuse disorder, you take this hallucinogen, you come back down from your trip, and oh hey, you're not addicted. Well, that worked for me. So <laughs> that, that sort of went, changed my life a lot, and I became involved and I began treatment. I uh, started working at the Department of Neurology for the University of Miami, who had been given FDA permission to test this drug on human beings. And I stayed there for a, for a couple of years. And what, what I noticed was that as remarkable as this substance was, it was only available to a very 
limited subset of individuals, high net worth individuals, because the average drug addict does not have, you know, at the time, $22,000 for one detox. The, the average drug dependent individual is wondering where to scrape together their next $10 to buy their next hit. And uh, I engaged in underground treatments where uh, you're basically committing felonies in order to help people. And the treatments consist of giving people this psychedelic, which would reboot their drug dependence. So that was, a, that was sort of a tangent where my life went in a different direction from, from hacking in the underground. Um, in in 20, 2010, I got a... I, I got a new Mac Pro, and that was that was always like a lot of fun, and it was like the last of the heavy metal dinosaurs when it was like you know the Mac Pro weighed 65 pounds. It was not just a computer; it was also a space heater because you turned the thing on, the ambient temperature in the room would rise by 15 to 20 degrees. It had 12 processors, or you know 24 if you believe in hyperthreading. But ed anyway, the end result was it also had a graphics card in it, and cypherpunks had continued going, that mailing list, except now there was some guy talking about this thing called Bitcoin on the cypherpunks mailing list. And I thought, okay, well, my computer is on forever. I mean, I never turn it off. It's a workstation. So why don't I start mining Bitcoins with this graphics card? <laughs> and that was... One of the things that I happened to do at that point in time, which seemed to have no particular purpose, except why not? It's interesting. It looks cool. I really like the concepts. Uh, I agree with all of this. And it wasn't until about two years later that all of that became extremely meaningful. I mean, I'm sure everyone sitting in this room has heard about, you know, the story of, you know, ordering two pizzas from Papa John's for 10,000 bitcoins. <laughs> Um, the, the, the part where all of this became real was when Silk Road went online on the dark net because suddenly all your play money, all this stuff that no one else understands, hey, I can buy drugs on the internet for free because what did it cost me to, to mine all the, these coins? The answer is nothing but some time on my graphics card. And that was sort of... In my opinion and my observations, the birth of cryptocurrency taking off. That was the first actual use case where people who did not know shit about technology suddenly poured into this because, hey, wait, how do I get my drugs? What, what is Bitcoin? There's no pay. I mean, they don't. How do I move money? And Bitcoin started becoming very important at that point in time and then of course more and more coins got released and we winded up with uh, sort of a wild west environment which is always incredibly magical and really fun and uh, recently I mean the the government of course wants to stop everything tax everything reduce uh, autonomy and freedom and privacy I mean the the book by George Orwell, 1984, it, it, it took a few decades, but we're, we live in it right now. We live in a surveillance planet where everything is watching you all the time. You don't have any privacy if you're connected to the Internet and you do not take very specific measures to protect yourself. And did all of this happen because of, you know, government mandated controls or what? No, I mean, it, it, it basically happened because, because of this. Oh my God, it's cool. It's brand new. I need this. And this is following you around. It tracks you. It listens to you. Everything is designed to strip you of your privacy. Now, I mean, the NSA and many other organizations are very busy collecting all the information they can possibly suck down on, on everybody. But the reality is, what, what did the great promise of the Internet turn into? It turned into micro-targeted advertising and a bunch of companies that want to sell you shit. I mean, Google is not one of the biggest companies on Earth because of 
most of the rest of their initiatives. They're the biggest company on earth because they have splattered tiny little text ads over every square inch of civilization. And people want to have a better understanding of how to target you and sell you things. And the larger social networks started spinning up. And of course, people poured themselves into those because, hey, this is cool. This is really interesting. And you know, now, right now, there's a lot of backlash against, for instance, Facebook, and you know their lack of protecting your privacy. But really, you know, if you rewind time back to some of his initial statements before he had advisors, before he had a higher level of sophistication regarding what he should or should not say, Mark Zuckerberg gave a very realistic answer: Why would people give you all this information? because they're dumb fucks, because people do not know or understand the ramifications of what they're doing. You give away your privacy. And most people give away their privacy every time they access the internet. So there are ways around that. There are ways to retain your autonomy. There are ways to retain your individual privacy and you know do as you would like to. And with uh, cryptocurrency, the interesting thing is there is the actual possibility of decentralization, where the classical power structures that control different societies begin to lose that control over people who opt out or opt to take a parallel path through, uh, through life or through at least parts of their existence. And that's sort of where we've arrived today. I mean, it's not exactly utopia. I mean, is Bitcoin and cryptocurrency manipulated? Fuck yes, it's manipulated. <laughs> but um, there, there's, there, there's a couple of companies that are really magical at that. You know, of course, Bitfinex and Tether. Tether, I mean, these are my opinions and observations. But Tether amounts to, you know, give us a dollar and it's worth one US dollar. Maybe, or give us a dollar, thanks very much, we spent it. And it's not actually there. And, you know, during, during the last, it's been a bad six months. I mean, the market cap for all of crypto has gone from about $850 billion thereabouts down to where we're at today, which, I don't know, bounces between 250 to $300 billion or something like that. But it's not going away. Uh, investors who were previously very leery of cryptocurrency have started publicly supporting it, Soros in, in particular, and uh, individuals who have made a lot of money with cryptocurrency, many of them accidentally, because the early, early adopters, I mean, it's kind of like me. It's like, why do this? Well, why not? No one was really sure what was going to happen, but they have taken money and poured it into a variety of funds, such as the Pineapple Fund, which is being used to fund psychedelic research. Uh, there's a lot of altruism. There's a lot of philanthropy occurring. And there's a, a fundamental shift in society happening. I mean, right now, one of the interesting things in the US is the concept of establishing a crypto utopia in Puerto Rico. I, mean, I don't know how that's going to pan out or what's going to happen with that. but Again, all of these things are progressions of what came before and building upon them and sort of reaching outwards from there. We're at a very interesting point in time as everything accelerates very rapidly. And I guess the, the, the big question is, are we going to attain freedom and autonomy and decentralization where this mythical as this mythical thing called the singularity, where we sort of cast off the limitations of what it means to be a human being, or are we really busy creating AIs and super intelligence, which is maybe not the world's greatest idea? I mean, is it such a wonderful idea to create something which is orders of magnitude smarter than you are? Well, maybe not, but we're about to find all these things out. And that's, that's pretty much it. That pretty much takes us into today and where we're at right now and what places like, like this are doing, which is gathering together you know, individuals who want to maintain autonomy, privacy, and control over their own lives. Um, thank you very much.
Thank you so much for, for your talk. It was interesting to see it from from perspective of someone who who saw the evolution of, of all these technologies up to this point uh, with, with cryptocurrencies and all of that. And I guess that uh, there will be some questions from the audience. So if you have a question, just raise your hand and I will give you a microphone. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm wondering, what are you doing these days? <laughs> and in uh, particular here in Prague. <laughs> Well, my my family and you know generations back are all from Prague and from the Czech Republic. I was born in California, and uh, my parents at the time uh, decided to stay there because you know first Hitler showed up and stripped the Czech Republic of the burden of democracy, and you know then in 1968 the Soviet Union rolled in, and at the time my parents were out of the country, and they went like, well fuck this, we're, we're not going back there. <laughs> so I was, uh, I was born in California, but I am a dual national. I, uh, that's, that's what I'm doing in Prague. And I was actually talking at a, at, a, at a psychedelics conference that is happening right now. I, I was actually talking about 15 minutes before I got here <laughs> to this one. And being here happened sort of accidentally because some of the organi organizers know me and they invited me to, to give a talk here to whoever might be interested. So more questions? Is it on? Hey. Okay. Um, so I've been only like reading and knowing about this since like February. And I've mostly been working with people who are more in the like ICO and make a quick buck off crypto side of things. Yeah. So to hear that there's like, uh, you know, like philanthropy and, and like nicer things, so to speak, going on with it. Um, I'm really curious about it. And I don't know if this is uh, going to come out more like a comment or a question, but what do you think about um, considering that, you know, crypto that started out as a like an ideal uh, for like uh, just freedom and privacy and stuff has like kind of been co-opted in itself by capitalism and... Uh, well. It, it, it's interesting because I was at this event that was organized by a friend of mine named Mark Margolius called uh, Crypto Psychedelic in, in Tulum. And, and the most fascinating thing about being there was just the group of people who showed up. So you'd have one guy who's literally covered from head to toe in glitter and he's got a unicorn horn coming out of his head. And he's vaping DMT, and he's having a conversation with a guy from South Korea wearing a three-piece suit about cryptocurrency. <laughs> and they both share pretty much exactly the same interests. <laughs> so it's an interesting mashup of, of energies. And yeah, I mean, personally, I mean, I was... I, I was an addict. I and you know gambling is fun and all the all the shit coins and all the ICOs and all of that. There was it was very entertaining in the last year. There's a lot of opportunities to make money and I'm you know gambling is fun. It's you know there there are all these different coins where they're powered by technology so advanced that it doesn't actually exist and there's just this white paper a bunch of hype you can buy into it and then you're basically doing a pump and dump. You hope to get a bunch of the coins on their way up, then run back into Bitcoin and let it all fall down and explode. That may be curtailed by some sort of government initiatives in various countries, but one of the simplest things that would curtail that is just if the different exchanges, you know, held something for three to six months. Okay, here's here's an ICO. Here's this new coin. Here is our roadmap. So does anything at all actually happen after the initial ICO or do they just spend the money and vanish? So if nothing happens, there's no technology backing the coin, then maybe don't release it. Because I would have to, you know, agree with your comment there and you know eighty five to ninety percent of everything is a Ponzi scheme. It's very similar to penny stocks, and it's very manipulated. There are very few 
coins or tokens, if you want to call them tokens instead, that actually do something useful and are not complete garbage. The, the whole philanthropy side it sort of happened accidentally, I think. I mean, none of that was planned. It's just like suddenly, well, all of your needs as a human being have been met. You have more money than you know what to do with. You always wanted a Ferrari. Okay, you bought a Ferrari. Maybe you bought two Ferraris. There, there's nothing left that you need. So, well, how can I make the world a better place? And what, what I'm doing right now is I'm a, I'm a consultant for a company called Clear Sky Recovery, which uh, reboots drug-dependent individuals with with Ibogaine treatment, which is what worked for me. And uh, that's, uh, it's basically a company within the medical tourism industry, except we're using psychedelics to accomplish uh, the reboot. And, and it works, and it's pretty effective. Anyone else? So uh, I have a question. Uh, since, since we are in, in this building in Paralnipolis, in the Institute of Crypto Anarchy, I would like to hear uh, what what do you think about uh, about the whole idea that uh, technologies like cryptocurrencies and Tor and uh, strong encryption and stuff like that, uh, whether it can bring more freedom to society and what do you think is the long term outlook of of the evolution of these technologies? Obviously, no one has a crystal ball, so. It's just a matter of what, what is your opinion on this? Well, my, my, my opinion has remained remarkably consistent, which is fuck the police state. I, I, I do not want to be controlled by a, an all-seeing government that tells me what I'm supposed to be doing with myself. I think that no matter what actions the government takes, there will always be a way around that. I mean, historically speaking, every time somebody builds a better mouse trap, five minutes later, there's a better mouse. I do not think it is stoppable. I mean, they can certainly slow it down, tour are half the exit nodes owned by the NSA. Probably, yeah, they are. But it will continue, it will progress, it's not going to stop. It will just evolve and change depending on how the environment changes. Will it succeed in producing decentralization where we all live in this perfect world of individual freedom? I don't know. Historically speaking, probably not. There will be isolated, isolated pockets where this is possible, but for the most part, the world is the way it is because the purpose of government is to perpetuate itself, and anything that threatens that, well, that upsets them quite a bit. So it will always exist. I think it will grow. I think that you know, crypto utopias are entirely possible, if not probable. Um, beyond that, it's very hard to say. Hi. Has the battle been lost with the loss of net neutrality? Um, has, has what been lost with net well, neutrality? Our, our battle for freedom, our freedom of information, our freedom of uh, privacy. I, I don't think it's been lost with the, the death of net neutrality. I mean, they, they've been trying to do that for a long time, and it may shift the balance slightly, but, I mean, the Internet is very resilient. I mean, it was created by DARPA, and I think their design goal was to create a decentralized network that could not be destroyed by taking out a central point of authority. Pro they, they succeeded, probably much to their regret. So it's that that no, I don't think that the, the death of net neutrality, which is temporary, I believe, is going to end everything. Thank you for your for your talk. Uh, and in the previous answer, you were talking about uh, this uh, mutual dynamics of uh, uh, of the crypto scene and uh, and the police police state, basically. So, so can we say that this this dynamic is actually necessary for the evolution you were talking about? That uh, when the police state stops uh, chasing us, then we stop uh, developing these tools to to evade it, and in, and in the end, it would uh, 
freeze and on some sort of dead point? I, I think that the police state does definitely drive the evolution of all these technologies and uh, that without that there would be much less motivation to keep developing and evolving all these tools that we have. But looking at all of human history up until this exact point in time, it's very unlikely that the, the police state will stop existing. It's every government on earth is pretty similar. Some of them are a lot more enlightened than others, but ultimately they want to be in control. And ultimately we don't want them to be. We want to have some level of autonomy and freedom. I mean, society has to function, but there's a theory that could function collaboratively and where everyone is engaged in doing something productive in whatever way they choose. But that's, that's idealism far more than reality in most places on Earth. In your opinion, um, how important was uh, the influence of psychedelics on IT industry? It was incredibly important. <laughs> if you if you look at the the evolution of all these different technologies, you know, let's see, Steve Jobs doing LSD was one of the single most important things I've ever done in my life. John Gilmore, well, John Gilmore is that guy I mentioned back then on the cypherpunks list. Cypherpunk list. I mean, he's one of the board members of MAPS, which is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, and he's not very shy about sh showing up at Burning Man. There's, uh, there's quite a few people. I think Bill Atkinson just very lately came out and said, yes, I, I wrote Hypercard because I did a lot of acid. Um, there are large numbers of people I know who actually have no interest in psychedelic drugs or blowing open their minds. They have never done a large dose of LSD, but they microdose. Why do they microdose? Because it allows creative problem solving to happen. Your brain works differently. Neuroplasticity is re-engaged and you suddenly have the ability to think different, to borrow a line from Apple. And do you see any, or do you have any predictions how uh, crypto scene will help uh, in research on uh, psychedelics? Well, it's already helping in research on psychedelics, such as the Pineapple Fund, which is, you know, basically giving money away to organizations that are working with psychedelics or working with medicalization research. And, you know, why did research with psychedelics end? Well, they ended because they really upset the government. I mean, why are psychedelics against the law? Is it because a benevolent and caring government deeply cares about you? No, they don't give a shit. They're, they're, they're against the law because when people do an entheogenic compound, I mean, entheogen, the very definition is, you know, seeing the divine within. You generally in technology encounter groups of people who are not particularly spiritual, who are not really that interested in religions. They, they're, they're very intellectual. They think about things. If you take a psychedelic drug, you don't need belief. You don't need faith. You don't have to believe in anything. You just attach this molecule to your receptors and suddenly you have a completely different perspective on what the world might be. Um, Technology and psychedelic drugs, and I would go so far as to say human evolution itself, are very intertwined. So if there are no more questions, uh, I would like to thank you again for, for an awesome lecture and discussion. Th th thank you very much. And uh, I would like to uh, say thank you also to the people on stream. And uh, if you liked uh, today's event, uh, we would be uh, very glad if you decide to uh, um, send us a small donation and if you come for uh, more events in the future. Uh, have a nice evening.
Kevin Bendick was a great example. I mean, Kevin Bendick was a brilliant social engineer. He was, yeah. I mean, I knew Kevin Bendick before, and he was, he, was, he was another person where I think the term teenage boy and sociopath are interchangeable. 